Welcome. I'm speaking to you from Berkeley, California, which sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. I respect the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and I honor their elders past and present. I am speaking from Berkeley, California, and I'm, my name is Christine Hastorf, and I'm the director of the Archaeological Research Facility. The Archaeological Research Facility is a research unit at the University of California Berkeley campus, supporting and promoting archaeological research across the campus and into the community. It hosts lecture series, workshops, and laboratories for archaeological research by all members, also funding faculty and graduate student research. We always have a project we are promoting, and currently we're raising funds to initiate a local summer field school for traditionally underrepresented students. If you are interested in supporting that, please give at our website listed here on the next slide. That, that, uh, these sites link you to the um, UC Berkeley's annual online fundraising celebration, the Big Give Day, which is March 11th, just around the corner. This year, ARF is delighted to have two anonymous donors offering a three to one match for donations of up to $10,000 for this program, this field school program. So on March 11th, please consider making an online donation that will be tripled in support of archaeology at UC Berkeley, and especially for this field and lab training program. So you can go to that link at the bottom that says support our programs. But we're all here today uh, for a real treat. If, like me, you are at home a lot and relish a quiet film, we have had one in The Dig, which was inspired has inspired ARF to host our guest today, Dr. Catherine Hills. Dr. Hills is a fellow emerita of Newnham College and a senior fellow of the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research, our sister unit at Cambridge University. Most of her academic career was as a senior lecturer in the Department of Archaeology there at Cambridge. Her research and teaching have focused on the archaeology of the regions around the North Sea, especially Britain and Scandinavia. During the second half of the first millennium AD, the period when the Western Ro Roman Empire disintegrated into the smaller territorial units, which became the medieval and modern states of Western Europe. Her major field project has been Spong Hill, North El Elm in central Norfolk a large early Anglo-Saxon cemetery, including 2,500 2, cremations and 57 inhumations, dating to between the 5th and early 6th centuries AD, which was excavated in the 1970s. She has hosted several British TV series, including The Blood of British, of the British, and Down to Earth. She is currently the editor of the Proceedings of the Cambridge Antiquarian Society. So she still remains very active in this time period. It is due to Dr. Hill's very significant knowledge and interest in the specific time period and region in England where Sutton Hoo is located, <clears throat> the site at the center of the film, that allow us to welcome her to speak to the UC Berkeley community today about this very site, Sutton Hoo. The finds encountered there, the people involved in that find, as well as the neighboring sites that allow us to learn about the cultural milieu in those early medieval times. Before turning over uh, the screen to Dr. Hills, I want to mention that there will be some images of human remains in some of the slides today. Now, I welcome Dr. Catherine Hills and her presentation, The Real Sutton Who, which includes the history and archeology span of the site and the film that the dig was based on. So thank you very much, Catherine Hills, and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Christine, for that very kind introduction. And thank you for invi inviting me to talk about Sutton Hoo, a site in which I have obviously long been very interested. I enjoyed the film, The Dig, and I was quite glad to be inspired by it to go back and revisit what one might call the true story, though exactly what that means is, is another matter and very complicated. And 
I liked a lot of things about the film. I thought it got some aspects of the site and the excavation very well. And there were a few other things which one might query, which may come up in my lecture. But what I want to concentrate on really is actually the history of the site at Sutton Hoo and the things that were discovered there, how it was discovered, a sort of mini history of, of, Anglo of, well, of, of English archeology span really, and the wider significance of some of the finds in terms of telling us all the site itself, in terms of telling us about um, what was going on in England, in the North Sea, in Europe as a whole in, in that period that Christine has mentioned when we were discovering I don't know discovering, but the, the whole the sort of disintegration of the Roman Empire and the emergence of what became all of the all of the kingdoms and territories of, of Europe afterwards, Western Europe at any rate. So I put on this slide because I think it actually illustrates something which was rather good in the film, which is the the, the nature of the of the Suffolk countryside, particularly when it's quite close to the sea as it is here in this picture. I'm going to show you some maps in a minute, don't worry. So we'll indicate exactly where we are in geography. But you know, this quite peaceful, pleasant sort of, 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 of landscape uh, with a certain amount of water in it. What you can see there is the River Deben. And if you look right out to the, the cloudy bit at the back of the film of the picture, that's where the North Sea is. In the foreground, foreground in the front, are the mounds and this is this is what I'm mostly going to be talking about. These are the burial mounds of Sutton Hoo. So next let's move on and show you where it actually is. There you go, there's a nice simple map and the point of this map is really to get us to remember that in the period I'm talking about, slightly earlier than that 700 AD you see at the top there, we haven't got big conglomerates, we haven't got an, a huge empire anymore, and we haven't got big kingdoms yet. We haven't got England or France or Denmark or what have you. We've got a lot of smaller units, which are very approximately sketched out here. And the one we're interested in is East Anglia, which is here, and Southern Hoo is just a bit north of Ipswich. So just to remind you of that sort of North Sea context, there's, there's Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Germany and the Netherlands, Belgium, France, all of those places. And here's the rest of Britain and Ireland is sneaking off the side there. OK, I've borrowed this map from a book by um, Nick Hyam and, and Martin Ryan because it, is, is, it enables me to show you the location of a few sites that I want to bring in at the end, recent discoveries that have begun to tell us more or make us ask more questions about Sutton Hoo. So here is Sutton Hoo itself. And on this map, it's extremely close to, oh, bother, come back. Um, on this map, it's extremely close to Rendlesham, one of the places I shall mention. I'll also talk about Prittlewell, which isn't marked on here. It's sort of underneath the edge of Harrow on the Hill on the Thames Estuary, the north side of the Thames Estuary. And over here, Somewhere like the D of Lichfield is where the Staffordshire hoard was discovered. I think this map was drawn maybe before that was, was found, I'm not sure. So those, I'm going to go right over there briefly, right at the end to look at the Staffordshire hoard um, and a little bit down here, but mostly what I'm talking about is this area. And here is a rather larger version of Anglo-Saxon East Anglia. There we have Sutton Hoo and Rendlesham again, and also Ipswich, which, really comes in at the at the very end of the time that that Southern Who is, is is being important and I just put this on really to um, well repeat what Christine has always said about has already said about my background <laughs> in Anglo-Saxon studies here is Spong Hill in the middle of Norfolk which was indeed a, a very large Anglo-Saxon cemetery with 2,500 Unfortunately, not all as perfectly preserved as these two, which I rather like with chunks of flint on the top of them and decoration and so forth. That's another story that I'm not telling today, but just to say that obviously I've been interested in all of East Anglia and all of Anglo-Saxon England to say nothing of all the surrounding areas of Europe. Right, so now let's, let's home in on, on the site itself. And these are the mounds. There are 17 mounds known. Since they've all been badly ploughed, it's possible that there were rather more of them that may yet one of these days be recovered, but 17 that we know of. 
And I want to use this slide just very briefly to outline the history of investigations into this site or damage to it, whatever you like to say, how you like to call it. So the first uh, record that we have um, is not actually a record, it's some broken pottery um, in the big mound, the big mound here, which is the one that most people know about, mound one. Um, there was a, a big hole dug in it and at the bottom of it was a smashed pot, which is a probably a late 16th, early 17th century Bellarmine pot. And when um, Martin Carver, who comes into this story later, started his work in the 80s and in fact cleared the site so that it looks like this, he um, worked out the sequence of disturbances to the site. So first of all, we have large holes dug in practically all of the mounds, unfortunately, in something like late 16th, 17th century. Various folklore attaches this to John Dee, um, the astrologer or scientist of Queen Elizabeth's day, but there's, I don't think there's any real evidence. But anyway, it's nice to think that maybe he came there and dug a hole in mound one and left his picnic behind. Um, so unfortunately, very probably, a lot of the material from most of the mounds was dug up at this time. And then later in the 19th century, and there's one newspaper record of it, the cause of these dents here, Rupert Bruce Mitford from the British Museum who dug here later, um, was hopeful that this was where the ships inside all the mounds had sagged. But unfortunately, um, I think Martin has conclusively demonstrated that what they are is 19th century trenches dug straight through um, from one side to the other. And since these trenches were probably the ones recorded in 1860. And 1860 is a time when a lot of archaeological interest is, is around in, in England. Uh, I think if a lot of things had been found in those mounds at that time, some of the news would have got out and some of the finds would probably have survived. Just up the coast at Snape, Septimus Davidson and some others excavated uh, a large ship and they, they produced a plan of it. And there was a record that had also been robbed earlier, but that was recorded and talked about. There was never anything about 19th century finds about Sutton Hoo. So I'm afraid the conclusion probably is that it was the 16th or 17th century characters who actually took away most of the stuff out of most of the mounds, which is rather disappointing. They managed to miss two and they missed the big one, which is great, um, because they were in the habit of digging in the middle of the mounds whopping great holes through the middle of the mounds, find the treasure, take it away, probably melt it down, never be seen again. Um, and this mound, the big one, had had a medieval track had gone across one end of it. I think it was that end. Anyway, part of one end of it had been dug away. And so when they dug in the middle of their mound, um, it actually missed the real middle and missed the treasure. Come back. Um, they also missed um, a small mound, which well, is not visible as a mound at all at the moment, Mound 17, because that one had two graves in it, a young man and a horse, and they dug a hole through the two of them. So it is possible that one or two other mounds here will prove to have been missed by the earlier robbers, but it's not very hopeful really. The most visible thing you can see here is the most recent, of course, which is a slip trench dug in about 1940. And one of the sad things about, about the, the excavation was that after the, the thing finished in the 1939 and World War II started, the site was briefly used for tank practice. Because you can see, you know, you've got a tank, you want hummy, hummocky things, you can go up and down, bonk, bonk, bonk. So they went, at this time, that mound hadn't been reconstituted. It was a sort of big hole with two narrow things on either side. Absolutely fantastic for driving your tank up and down over. So, and they also dug trenches like this and they used, and you know, they didn't do it for too long because somebody knew about the site and stopped them and moved them on, but it did do quite a lot of damage. Um, so that's sort of the history, the visible history of the site encapsulated in, in what you can actually see surviving there. Okay, so then we come to 1938 and these two characters. And this is another of the things that's really quite good in the, in the dig. Um, the two central characters are you know, played by brilliant actors, rather younger and more glamorous, perhaps, than the original characters, who were both 50-ish, I think, when the, when, when the excavation took place. 
but both interesting people in their different ways. Here is Edith Pretty, and she had well, she had quite an interesting life. Her she her father was a, a wealthy Manchester um, businessman. I think he was into gas works. And in the first decade of the uh, of the twentieth century, they, the family seemed to travel indefatigably. They they went to Egypt several times. They went they went round the world. They went down the Red Sea to to India, to um, Japan, to San Francisco, and back again. On another occasion, they went to South Africa. Although that sadly was when her father died, actually, when they were traveling in South Africa. On another occasion, she went to Iceland. I mean, she, she you know, constant travel and the details of the slow ships full of cockroaches and rats and how long it would have taken them to get there is extraordinary. So she did that, but she was also very much into charitable activities and other kinds of activities. There's a, a rather exhausting list of all the organizations that she was head of or running up. Um, where they were living in Cheshire in the 1920s. In the First World War, she did train as a nurse and was nursing for, um, I think, in 18 and 19. Um, but she only married Frank Pretty, who came from Ipswich, when, after her father had died in about 1926. And by that stage, she was over 40. So she married Frank, came down, they bought the house at Sutton Hoo, which was not, it was quite a recent house at that stage, built in 1910. And by all accounts, they were, they were pretty happy for several years. It is said that Frank had asked her to marry him every year since she was 18, but she only gave in, as I said, you know, 20 years later. And then somewhat to everybody's astonishment, I imagine, she discovered she was pregnant, aged 46, and had a son, Robert. And after that, it said she was never in particularly good health. And then very sadly, a few years after that, um, her husband, Frank, became ill and died of cancer quite young. So by the time you get to 1937, 1938, um, she's a quite lonely widow with a young son and not in terribly good health and rather interested in spiritualism and interested in making, you know, can she possibly contact the dead? She's still actually uh, acting as all sorts of charitable activities and a magistrate. She was one of the first, if not the first, woman magistrate, JP. So quite a forceful, interesting woman. And the Sutton Who episode is really at the end of her life, at the end of a life which had been more interesting than, than one might, might realise. And if we turn to Basil Brown, Basil Brown was a local Suffolk man he um, comes from a small farming family. In fact, he um, tried to make a, a living as a farmer for quite a long time, but partly he was um, more interested in other things like astronomy and archeology. span And um, partly I think it was quite a tough time in, in the 1900s uh, farming in East Anglia. He left school age 12 and ever afterwards a was a voracious consumer of all sorts of, of literature, and particularly, as I say, astronomy, which comes into the film, and archaeology. Um, you can see he's a bit less gl glamorous than Ray Fiennes, but, you know, an, an interesting character and with strong views about things and with a, a kind of natural ability for some aspects of archaeology. It is said, well, I'm sure his techniques of digging wouldn't stand up these days, except for the one and only, you know, the magnificent um, uncovering of the ship, which, which was an achievement that would be, you know, you wouldn't make it better now, I don't think. So anyway, Edith Pretty was interested in the mounds. What is in these mounds in my garden? Curiosity. And she got in touch with Guy Maynard at Ipswich Museum and he said, OK, I'll, I'll send you Basil Brown, because by that time, Basil had given up, long given up farming and was existing various odd jobs, but a lot of a lot of digging and particularly digging um, on behalf of Ipswich Museum. He was the sort of local field archaeologist, really, for, for Suffolk. So he came along, um, left a Roman villa that he was otherwise mostly digging. And in the first year, 1938, which is left out of the film The Dig, he um, looked into three burial mounds and discovered, you know, bits and pieces of stuff, but also established, as I've said earlier, that all of them had been disturbed. So then the next year, which was 1939, they decided to go for mound one, the big one, let's go for, for mound one. 
And so he did indeed start digging Mound One and let us see what happened. And eventually he came to this, perhaps, perhaps this black and white picture. This is the picture after it's all been excavated and uncovered. And what you have to remember is that there's almost nothing, there's no, there's no wood left, there's nothing organic left um, of that ship. And there's not, there's hardly any organic material left in the whole of the site because it's, it's sandy, everything, everything's gone that's, that's a wood or, or, or leather or textile or human body or anything like that. But what Basil knew from his previous, the, the, the 1938 season had um, produced a number of, of iron, iron ship rivets and he read up the snake excavation and looked at their plan and knew how you know how there were these rows and rows of ship rivets that outlined where a ship had been and so as soon as John Jacob one of the gardeners that this is pretty gave him to um, help on the excavation um, as soon as he said I've got this bit of iron um, Basil you know thought right this is it and he, he knew from the shape of it and that was probably what it was and so they excavated, and you can see these rows and rows and rows. These, these, these things here are rows and rows and rows of very rusty old ship rivets. And um, there's perhaps the better coloured picture here. And it's by following that, by following the little rows of red rusty ship rivets set into sand that was a slightly darker brown than the surrounding sand, that, you end, that they ended up with this ship. It's, it's, it's really a fantastic achievement because that ship was not there, but Basil found it. So he was excavating with these um, two, two gardeners and beginning to find the ship. And the news got out partly from Guy Maynard in Ipswich sending inquiries up to the Isle of Man about Viking ship burials. And Charles Phillips heard of this from Cambridge. He was a fellow at Selwyn, a tutor, in, a history tutor actually. And um, he came along and, and looked and took one look and sort of said, oh my godfathers or something. And after that, a team was assembled of, of, of what you could call professional archeologists. I mean, yes, I mean, the profession of archeology span is something that kind of evolved during the 20th century, I suppose. And you could say that Basil Brown, given that he excavated and was paid for excavating, was more of a professional than some of the others who did it as part of their other, other careers. Anyway, he, um, just before I leave this, this is, this is what the poor old ship looked like um, just a, about a few days after war was declared in September, um, back filled with bracken and left therefore terribly vulnerable to the tanks driving all over it. And another point to make here is that this photo is by Mercy Lack. Now, one of the things that people have picked up in the film is the invented entirely fictional cousin of Edith Pretty, who I'm um, called something like Lomax, who is, who, who is a, a photographer who takes the photographs and um, has a love affair with, um, with Peggy Piggott. And he is totally fictional and doesn't exist at all. The photographs of the site were mostly taken by members of the team and those of the ship were taken by Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff, two women photographers, school teachers on their holidays, who turned up just as the, the dig had got to this stage and um, took lots of fantastic pictures, including these early color pictures. This is, th this is their picture. This is a 1939 photograph, um, which is quite surprising given how little um, available color photography there was in those days. Okay, so here we see the team of assembled um, once once the outside world had um, discovered about the site and um, this team I'm so sorry that was my phone um, this team appeared of, of archaeologists who in those days were quite young but uh, actually all most of them ended up having long careers and long lives and becoming professors and so forth so here we actually see Mrs Pritchy sitting in her chair and she is looking at um, Charles Phillips down there, and there is Basil, and you see he's looking quite small actually, and I'm not sure who that is. That one is, um, goodness, I think that's Stuart Piggott. And here we've got Peggy Piggott, you can't really see her properly, and that's Grimes, that's William Grimes, that's Brailsford, I think, and I think that's Stuart again. Okay, yes, oh goodness, Margaret Guido, it says, that was her name after she was married for the second time. So. 
they excavated all the fantastic finds and there were sort of various stories which they told afterwards. They were staying down in the in, in the hotel in Woodbridge, the nearest town in the Bull, and people were saying, oh, what are you finding? You found anything tonight? And um, and I think it was Grimes who had the great gold buckle in his pocket. And he said, oh, yes, yes, my pockets are full of gold. And of course it was true. They really were full of gold. But fortunately, if you say it like that, everybody thinks it's a joke. So it's quite safe, a good way of protecting it. OK, and here's this uh, plan of all this amazing stuff, which I'll show you better, but that's to show you what the, what the plan looked like. I, incidentally, um, Basil, once they'd brought all the, they, they, they decided to assemble this team, Basil was supposed to stop work. Um, there he is in this picture here. He didn't, in fact, and it's a very good thing, given the timing of everything. He, but he did leave the burial chamber in the middle and he went round and he dug out the other end of the ship. If he hadn't dug that, done that, we wouldn't have had the whole of the ship. But um, as it was, there was the, the burial chamber in the middle of the ship, ready for these characters to come along and dig everything out like that. And here's a much later reconstruction. This is one of Martin Carver's reconstructions, suggesting that the body was originally in a coffin with these things on top of it and other things piled around it and so forth. There is room for argument about exactly well, you know, whether he was in a coffin or lying on a beer or, or what have you. I mean, this is quite a plausible reconstruction. Um, it gives you some idea of, of the kind of stuff there is. Uh, if, when we get to Prittlewell, you can see one that's actually more or less survived in situ. So you can see the kind of thing. OK, so they all went away. And um, one of the things that you don't get so much from the account of the excavation as you did from the film, The Dig, was the, the, the looming imminence of, of World War II, which it obviously was. And, and that was one of the things that constrained, I think perhaps I'll just go back. No, I won't, I'll, I'll stay here with this. That was one of the things that constrained the, the, the sort of speed with which things happened. The fines were packed up and taken to London. And then after everything had been emptied out of the ship, and um, all the diggers had gone away and Basil backfilled it with bracken. In August, they had a coroner's inquest to decide the ownership of the treasure because it, it, was, it was a treasure. And the, at that time, it's now changed. There was a law, an ancient medieval law still um, in use until the late 20th century called the law of treasure trove. And the only way I can ever remember how that law actually operated was by thinking about Sutton Hoo, because what it said was that if you found a hoard of treasure buried in the ground, you had to decide whether the person who buried it meant to come back for it, but never did. And if they did mean to come back for it, then it actually belonged to the Crown, it belonged to the, the government. Um, and some people have suggested that might be because you wanted to, it was a way of preventing tax evasion, you bury your treasure in the ground, then you can't have it taken off you by the tax collectors. I don't know about that. But anyway, that was that was that was one version. The other idea, the, the, the alternative interpretation was that it had not been left with intent to recover. It had been deposited in the ground, um, given to the ground, given to the dead person to take with them into the afterlife. And in that case, it belonged to the landowner. Um, and so this, the judgment was given by the coroner um, in August, August the 14th, something like that in, in Woodbridge and people quoted Beowulf and um, you know, it was decreed pretty, pretty clearly that nobody had intended to come back and take that stuff out. And that therefore it belonged to Mrs. Pretty, Mrs. Edith Pretty. And the, the stories about tension between Charles Philip and um, Basil Brown are not really fair. Um, actually, the, the tension was between um, Ipswich Museum and Charles Phillips and the justifiable wish for the Ipswich Museum people to get the treasure, to have the treasure, their Suffolk treasure, which, you know, it's, it's never gone away, that feeling that, you know, it's a Suffolk treasure and it should stay in Suffolk. But Probably Edith was right, and she probably decided independently, though Charles reckoned it was partly his idea and partly her spiritualist advisor. But I think it was probably true that sending it up to London was the best thing to do. So it went to the British Museum and throughout the war, it was kept safely and packed up in boxes in a disused underground with a lot of other things from the British Museum. After the war, 
it became the task of Rupert Bruce Mitford, and here is Rupert Bruce Mitford, who was um, cur curator of, the, well, by the time I met him in the 1970s, about 1970, he was the curator of the medieval and later collections in the British Museum. And so it was his task, and this is another key person, here is Angela Evans. So it was his task to write up the site and fully publish it. That there'd been really a rather excellent preliminary publication in, in the journal Antiquity in the winter of 1940, which I think is pretty impressive, which actually outlined all the issues that everybody's argued and discussed ever since. But anyway, Rupert and Angela and a team of other people eventually produced enormous, um, fantastic volumes, three volumes, except there are four because the third one was so fat, it had to be divided into two. And they're wonderfully illustrated with black and white photographs, mostly, not so many color. And um, also lots of discussion about technical aspects of the material and parallels. It's, it's not fair to say it's an art historical uh, publication, it's archaeology and art history, but very much focusing on Mound One and the finds, particularly all aspects of them, which of course have ever since been on display in the British Museum. Now, questions about the ship itself remained. It has been probably beautifully recorded by Commander Hutchison, who you saw standing in that um, picture of Mercy Lax in 1939. But unfortunately, uh, his records were destroyed in the war. I think he might even have been killed in the war. So his detailed records and drawings don't survive. And there were quite a lot of things we still don't know about that ship. And indeed still argued about, particularly whether it actually had a mast and therefore a sail. That is an ongoing dispute, which I won't enter into not being a marine archeologist. So anyway, Rupert thought that there should be further investigation. I'm sure he's right. He came back and they opened up the poor old ship. And if you think back to what it looked like when Mercy Lack photographed it, you can see it's a bit of a, a savage remnant. But anyway, they very carefully um, uncovered it, excavated it, took a plaster cast of it, turned that plaster cast into um, a permanent, um, permanent. They did it in sort of bits of, it was quite a complicated technical thing, different you know, sort of sets of segments of it that were all slotted together. But unfortunately, it, I, I think because it was so warped and bashed, it didn't answer a lot of the questions they wanted. And I have no idea whether the British Museum still keeps the plaster cast of it somewhere. The other thing they did was they sieved all the spoil tips and recovered some quite key little fragments that had been missed before and also took apart the mounds and the, what was left of the, of the mound that the ship had been buried in and excavated the prehistoric things underneath. Okay, so that was the 1960s project and eventually then, as I say, these um, beautiful fat volumes came out in the 70s. And let's just look quickly at some of the stuff. Here is the helmet and the scepter and the sword. And the helmet and, and the scepter are the kind of thing that, that, well, you were seeing pictures of them before. And this, the helmet, turns up on the cover of practically every edition of Beowulf and every copy of any book on Anglo-Saxon England, actually. Um, and together they, they say possibly this is something to do with, with, with authority, with power. It's, it's one of the reasons why people talk of the burial as being that of a king. And I think that's not unreasonable, to be honest. Um, the helmet is, is a, a development from the kind of, of elaborate parade helmets that were worn by late Roman emperors, Constantinian period, for example. And there was a purse with 37 coins and one black, one ingot and three blanks, I think. And you would think that this purse would be really useful in giving us a nice precise date for the deposition of the burial. Of course, as archeologists, you will know perfectly well, it would only give you at best a TBQ, a terminus post quem, that the earliest date at which it could have been buried. But in fact, it's that these coins are Merovingian, they're Merovingian tremices. And this kind of coin current, particularly in the late 6th and 7th century, early 7th century, doesn't very often have the name of a king on it. So they don't have um, 
things that allow you to tie them into historical people, at least not very often. There is one coin here that has the name of a Merovingian king, Theudebert II, and his reign began in 595 AD, he reigned I think 595 to 612. So that gives you, well it gives you 595 as a starting point, which is, which is okay, it's something. The other coins will be, well, 600, the decades after 600, thereabouts. There's some debate and discussion about how early this collection of coins could have been assembled. One argument is that it could have been assembled as early as 613. Others would put it later in the 630s. It, it, it is an, an ongoing discussion. And as far as dating, precise dating is concerned, everything points to 600 plus one or two decades. It, it points to the seventh century. Somewhere in the seventh century, the estimates have gone up and down actually, the early to the mid or even the late seventh century, but generally kind of settle around somewhere 620, 630, something like that. There is very little organic material. One, um, there, was, there were two radiocarbon dates. One of them was on of a piece of wood which gave a very anomalous date. I can't remember if it was extremely early or extremely late, but it was decided that there was something wrong. It had been contaminated by fungus or it, it didn't work. But there was also beeswax out of a lamp. And that had an initial radiocarbon date in the 1970s, which came out too early. It came out in the sixth century, which didn't seem to make sense. But of course, later radiocarbon dates um, have become calibrated and Bayesian statistically and analyzed and so forth. So it comes out to being the first half of the seventh century or thereabouts. So it, it doesn't give us any greater precision. I mean, it's a pity because you would think that beeswax uh, would be pretty contemporary. It wouldn't be ancient. Uh, and so therefore it would be nice if it gave us a more exact date, but everything homes in on that period in the early decades of the seventh century which of course allows everybody to pin it to a piece of history. The Venerable Bede writing in the eighth century says that there was a king of East Anglia called Redwald. And he refers to Redwald because he was briefly converted to Christianity on a visit to his Christian cousins in Kent. But when he got home, his wife said that was a bad idea. She didn't think you should desert your pagan gods. And so according to a very old man who told the Venerable Bede that he'd seen it when he was young, Redwald had a temple which had altars to other gods in it, and he added an altar to the Christian God as well, just to be on the safe side. And I'll come back to Christianity because it's quite interesting, this sort of mixture of ideas about how one might interpret it or represent it or understand whether anybody was in some sense or not a Christian. So Redwald's dates are probably something like, well, he probably died something like 624 AD thereabouts. And so he fits. And so he's nearly always um, supposed to be the person buried in Mound One. Um, I have had phases of being quite exasperated about this because I don't think archaeology should be totally within a, a, a sort of straight jacket or very limited historic dates and names and so forth. But anyway, he does seem to work pretty well. So I suppose I don't think I can get away from saying that's possibly, probably, perhaps who it was. Okay, and to continue the theme of being dressed up partly as a Roman emperor, here are the shoulder clasps, which are really, they're, they're really fantastically beautiful. They're, they're you know, so, such exquisite workmanship. You know, these are gold and these little garnets, you know, to make these animals and so forth. Um, I think it was Rupert who connected it to this, this, this imperial statue of Augustus, but Recently, people who looked at it, like Noel Adams, for example, have said that it wouldn't work fastening something metallic like that. Um, it might have been leather or Noel even suggests it could perhaps have been something padded. Anyway, these things, those things fasten, I mean, you know, they're sort of fastening elaborate things on your shoulder that make you look grand and large, while the helmet is making you look even grander and larger, like a terrifying Germanic god and a Roman emperor, which I think is part of the idea, really. Um, there are other things which, here are these hanging bowls, 
which are fascinating because they carry a completely different kind of ornament from the one that you've just seen on the shoulder clasps. It's this very sort of enamel, spirally, celtic -y stuff. And it, it does, you know, it does look as though it descends pretty directly from the kind of ornament that you find in Iron Age Europe, pre-Roman, non-classical Iron Age Europe. And here we have one of these fantastic bowls with this very elaborate, it's got red enamel and it's also got milfury glass, little slices set, set into the middle of it. And there are things that have come from further afield. These are possibly gifts coming all the way from Byzantium, from the Eastern Mediterranean. There used to be an argument that said that these spoons showed that the um, person commemorated had been baptized because they say Saulos and Paulos, um, some Latin or Greek scholar, one in Latin letters and one in Greek, but tends to be the feeling that one of them, this one I assume, is a proper Paulos and that the person doing this copied that and didn't really understand what they were doing. So it isn't necessarily saying Saulos, Paulos, which would of course mean the conversion of Saul to Paul. Um, and yes, there's a cross in the bottom of this bowl, but you know, somebody getting a gift with something Christian in it, or you know, Christian iconography on it, isn't necessarily themselves Christian. So it's, it, it's an interesting gift from, from the Byzantine Empire but doesn't necessarily say anything about the beliefs of the person who received them. Intriguingly, this one might say a bit more. This is the great gold buckle with really elaborate, these are very complicated animal ornaments. There's a sort of knot in the middle there. Let me try and do one of them. There's an eye and there's the back of the head that goes into a beak. And that is a neck which goes around, look, there's a back leg and there's the leg tied around the body and there's its back foot up there. You need to see them drawn out, they're very complicated. This one's a bit easier, look, this is just one little beast. There's his eye and there's his hooked beak and there's his front, um, front hip and a paw, look, there's a paw. And then there's the rest of his body, he's a sort of beetle almost, and there's his hip and there's his claw like that. Okay, so, and when you first look at this, you think, wow, that's a great clonking amount of gold, which it certainly would be. But actually, it opens up, it's hollow. And that is interesting because there are whole classes of hollow, hollow buckles and hollow other things which have relics inside them, you know, valuable things that were holy or magical or important in some way or another. Um, there are Merovingian buckles which have very Christian symbolism on them. So if anything suggested a tinge of Christianity to this character, it would actually be this, this very um, Germanic looking zoomorphic decorated buckle, unexpectedly. Okay, so the stuff in Mound One has come from all over the place. You know, there are all these spots are all where the different, co the coins all came from different mints all over what's now France. Um, we've got the Anastasia's dish and other things coming from Constantinople. And in fact, the garnets, which are ornamenting it, would have originally come from even further. They'd come way off this map. Some of them might have come from Europe, from Bohemia, but some of them came all the way from Sri Lanka or India, because that seems to be where a lot of the garnets in, in this kind of, of, of um, stuff came from. And one of the interesting things about the Sutton Hu um, garnet material is that it's so beautiful and so elaborate and skilled and uses such very large garnets at a time when um, on the continent they were getting rather short supply of garnets. So how come here we've got lots of nice big garnets getting through from India still, still at a time when in France they've got hard, you know, it's, the supplies are running out and they're using little mingy little ones. Okay, so on to the next phase of digging, um, which was in the 1980s. Um, River Bruce Mitford had continued to think there should be more digging, more mounds dug up. And it wasn't in the 70s, it really, when I, when I was digging Southern Who actually, it wasn't really a time when people thought that you ought to be digging kings or digging treasure or you should be um, stripping open huge enormous sites and looking for ordinary people like the ordinary people at, at Spong Hill maybe and um, settlements. But anyway, they managed to get um, the, 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 some funding together from the Society of Antiquaries, the British Museum, I think probably on BBC as well. 
and Martin Carver um, was the person who was appointed to direct it. And here you see him talking to Charles Thomas, uh, Charles, Charles Phillips in old age. Martin is a very energetic person. Here you see him nearly being drowned um, in a replica ship. Up here it says, our best wishes for your next trip by Viking ship <laughs> or something. Um, they are now making a replica of the Southern Who ship, but this was a replica of, of the Oseberg ship, I think. And clearly the um, 20th century people were not so skilled in sailing it as the Vikings were. Anyway, so Martin did the assorted things at the beginning. He um, had the site cleared. So here we are, we have it all laid out. That's like the picture I showed you at the beginning, come back here. And here is mound one, the big one. And he, I don't know, oh, it's gone mad on me. He wanted, he, he looked at Mount 2 and at Mount 5 and at 17. I can't remember if he looked at any others. But in any case, the point of Martin's approach was that he wasn't going to be just mound digging. It was going to be a site. I mean, indeed, as we were all thinking in the 70s, what you should be doing is digging sites, not just digging holes in things. And he was also pretty clear that um, you should only dig a part of it and leave a part of it for the future and that the whole thing should be put in a much wider context, you know, the excavation, the survey, the immediate valley, East Anglia, the North, you know, going out and out into all these ripples and circles. And there you can see the sort of extent of his excavation. And he did all sorts of survey in advance with um, standard machinery and experimental machinery and all sorts of kinds of things to try and find out as much as possible about the site before actually setting spade or trowel into the ground. And there we have an overview of where the excavation in the 80s was. And what this slide also shows is Tranma House, which was where Edith Pretty lived. It was originally called Southern Who House, I suppose. And um, the last people to live in it before the National Trust took it over um, were the Tranmers, in particular, Mrs. Annie Tranmer, who was um, the person who was living there at the time that Martin was doing this excavation. And so if you, if you look at it, you know, there, there is a sort of open area excavation and he's looking at this area and managed to find what, what they were expecting, probably partly because of my Spong Hill, was that there would be very dense burials in here, but there weren't. There was nothing here, but there were these characters out here and the ones around Mount Five. Now, Martin kind of sorted out an a, a potential sequence of burials. And this, um, he started out with this character here, which is Mount 17. Um, Yes, so okay, so so here is his sequence, and there is still room for argument and for finessing it, but broadly speaking, and this is, is the beginning, which is actually the last most recent excavation on the site, was in fact in 2000 AD, underneath the visitor centre, where they found a cemetery, 6th century, which mostly predates Sutton, the, the big mounds, which are a short distance away, so it's possibly the family or group of families who were burying um, in the Tranma House Cemetery, who then um, got, got above themselves or got more powerful and richer and started burying um, under the mounds. And so this is starting out with cremations in bronze bowls, and then there's the man and the horse, the mound two, which I'll come to, and mound one. Finally, he puts that at the end, in fact. Um, and then I don't know what number six is. I couldn't discover what his number six was. Um, and number seven are these strange burials, which I'll come on to in a minute. OK, so here's the Tranma House site um, underneath what is now the visitor centre. And there are inhumations and uh, cremations and some in bronze bowls and so forth there. And then here is Mount 17. And this is one I mentioned earlier. Here is, I think, where the rubber, the rubber hole was there. But it missed everything because, you know, it was in between the two. And there you have the young man and he's got a coffin and he's got various pots and things with him and he has a horse. And in his grave, he also had the bridle. 
So there you go. There are all the fittings, very elaborate fittings for that horse. See, that kind of thing might well have existed in some of the other burials, but alas, we don't have them. But anyway, and it's and then Mount Two. Now Mount Two had been dug by by Basil, and he'd been a bit mystified by it and found a few things. And what the um, Carver team worked out was that there had been originally down here is a rectangular outline of a white sort of small chamber or a wide coffin. And then um, 1600-ish, a hole had been dug through the middle and all the treasure had been taken away. And then in the 19th century, somebody had come along and dug a trench through it. And then Basil came back in 38 and did another hole and didn't find anything very much. So they finally took it all to pieces and worked out that there must have once been a ship there because of all these ship rivets, um, lots of them. So once upon a time, um, there had been a ship on top of a chamber grave. And they also did sort of clever sciencey things, which allowed them to work out where there had been things like a bucket and um, uh, iron things. And, you know, to, to work out to some extent what had been in this, this grave, um, most of which had been completely disappeared and that it once had a, a, a ship on top of it. Okay, then there's the Mound One, which we've heard about already. And this explains more carefully um, why the rubber, the rubber hole missed it, because the edge of the, the edge of the original mound was probably something like that. And at an earlier stage, it had been whittled away and possibly like that. In 1939, that was the edge of their mound there. So you see this rubber pit here, and it's just about missed the burial chamber, which was there. So that was, that was fortunate. Now, the other thing that Martin found was these, what he's put there, these Christian killing places, which is, a, this is the bit where we will see traces that, 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 that there are no actual skeletons surviving on this site because organic material has gone completely. And originally the idea was that in Mound One, um, there was perhaps a, a cenotaph, no body, but actually it's simply the fact that, that bodies decay in that soil. I mean, anybody who's dug in that sandy soil knows that they simply don't survive. And so when Martin sort of stripped open this area, he began to find, well, his team began to find these dark marks, which actually are the remnants of bodies. And they're in two rather strange groups. And so here you are. And I think you can see this poor chap has had its head cut off. And in a Roman cemetery, you might not think that was too untoward, but in what turned out to be something like the eighth or ninth century, um, it is rather surprising. And this is the most gruesome slide, which I won't spend too long on. So these shadow bodies, these dark, um, this character has been all scrunched up and all bound up. Let's leave it, yes. So, so the remains of these bodies in two groups, one group was, was around one of the mounds, Mound Five, and one group was out in the middle of the field. And it does seem most probable that what they are were executions. Executions at a time after the burial site had ceased to be used for the burial of, of royal family. East Anglian kings, but it was possibly still a bit gruesome. It was a strange place that, you know, in the olden days they used to bury people there. And what this slide shows is that if you look on um, an early map, there's this little thing here. And if you look at that, that's actually a representation of a gallows. And it actually says Gallows Hill anyway. So they originally had the um, the execution site down near the barrow, the, near the barrows, near the Sutton Hoo barrows, and then at some stage, 12th century, they moved it up there. So, you know, it's a site that um, possibly had some evil thoughts about it. There you go, there's the summary of that. So the family cemetery underneath the visitor centre, um, the burial mounds, the possible 8th century executions, the um, 12th century ones up there, and yep, okay, and various things. Near, here's the Tranmer House Cemetery, the one under the visitor centre, and there are probably, there's probably a lot more to find there. It's a bit frustrating. I suspect there's a lot more that one could discover there. Maybe one day we will. Right, so I've gone through 
the Southern Who material slightly, slightly quickly, but that's possibly a good thing. It gives me time to talk about these other sites which have been discovered recently. So here is the cover of the large book that's recently been published about the Staffordshire Hoard. And the Staffordshire Hoard was discovered over here, a long way away from all the area that we normally think of as being Anglo-Saxon England. And it was a great heap of golden things discovered by a metal detectorist. And it's still not at all clear how or why it got there. But a wonderful amount of study has been devoted to the objects. And because they're all broken and twisted and squashed together, um, it's been possible perhaps to do more technical analysis than is necessarily permitted for the beautiful Southern New Objects, which are on display in the British Museum. So that all sorts of things have been discovered, for example, about the golden objects. These are, the, the, there's an enormous amount of gold. There isn't any iron, there isn't any copper. It's nearly all gold and a little bit of silver. And what we've got there is about 70 sword pommels or fittings from about 70 swords. There's a bit of a hilt thing. There's a bit of um, a helmet. And here is a scrumpled up cross. And there's a little thing from the handle of a, of a knife, a big knife, a sax. Here's something with an inscription. I'll, I'll come onto these again in a moment. And here are these sword pyramids. And I've just got that there because it's a nice picture and it has a whole sort of heap of them and makes it look a bit hoard-like. So several different scenarios. It is this it almost certainly um, from defeated enemies. Um, the paraphernalia belonging to the kings, possibly killed by the Mercian King Pender, who would fit possibly in the date, um, or his or his son. Endless warfare between all these characters in the seventh century. So, is it? Um, a royal treasury, a collection of stuff that they've got by warfare or by gift or tribute or what have you, which has then been stolen by somebody who's going to bury it in a hole in the ground where it stayed for all these years. Um, that definitely would have been treasure trove if it had been found a few years because possibly, well, you would have endless arguments. You can see why that law didn't work, arguing about whether, you know, anybody had intended to come back for it or not, or has it been sacrificed to the gods or, or what? I, there, there is still enormous debates. You can read chapter 10 of this book to see what you think about it. But certainly it's thrown a great deal of light on the technicalities, the technical skill of the Anglo-Saxon craftsmen. They could do things like changing the, um, enriching the surface of the, of the golden object so that you come out with a contrast. Do you see there's a contrast there? So they've differentially treated different bits of that so that some of it comes out lighter or darker. Um, exquisitely sort of fitted together garnets, which you which you could see on the Sutton Hoo things. The analysis of the garnets here is what shows us that some of them have come from Sri Lanka, some of them have come more um, nearby, well not nearby, from the, from the Czech Republic, from Bohemia. And the interesting thing is it's, it's, it's all masculine war gear, it's all bits of swords with the odd bit of helmet, but also scrumpled up Christian crosses and this inscription. So here is this inscription. It's a folded up arm from a cross and it's a, a rather aggressive bit out of the Bible. Something like, arise, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered and may those who hate you flee from your face. Um, written twice in slightly different script. This inscription, incidentally, um, like the coins from Southern Who, has been the, the, the point of debate about the date of the deposition of this material. Um, different um, paleographers have had slightly different views about exactly where in the seventh century this inscription should be put. But in the seventh century, I think tending towards the middle of the seventh century. And what the whole, the hoard as a whole conjures up is this fascinating combination of warfare and Christianity. So it was quite a muscular Christianity these early Anglo-Saxon kings went in for and all these stories a bit like the Constantine story that you know they they said okay if I win this battle um, then I'll accept this god. If this god wins the battle for me then okay he's worth worshipping and if not not. Um, and so here you have something like this this, this. this is a reconstruction of the cross that you see folded up um, not that one, this one here. 
So if you go along, right, here we are. So a reconstruction drawing of that unfolded, and you can see that it has these twisted animals, the twisted zoomorphic animals, particularly style two, this is called, of, of which the um, Anglo-Saxons were very fond. And at first sight, you might think of this as being something that represents pagan ideology, pagan ideas and beliefs, and indeed it probably does or did, but it seems to have been possible to incorporate it into um, their new Christian ideas. And I just put on this object, this is a metal detected find of a ring found in Essex. And if you look, you can see there's a rather strange, almost headless person. And, oh goodness, sorry about this. And he's holding a processional cross, which is a bit like the Staffordshire Hall big cross. There are some smaller crosses from Staffordshire as well. But so this, this mixture, that ring is quite extraordinary. It's got this very Christian cross, but it's got those looming birds that look very predatory and you know, sort of Odin like. Um, and it's that kind of mixture, which is, is so fascinating about this seventh century art. It, it, it really. And this kind of thing here. So, okay, we've got the shoulder clasp again, and look at this, this these creatures going around here, um, and there's the Staffordshire Horde. Quite a lot of the material in the Staffordshire Horde is so like the Southern Who material that it has been seriously suggested, I think with good reason, that it might very well have been made in the same workshop. It'd be very nice if one day we managed to get something that actually clinches that, but um, okay. But I put this on also because of this mixture of Christian and, and um, non-Christian because here we have the Book of Daro, a very early manuscript, um, another of those intellectual arguments about whether it was made in, in Daro in Ireland, is it Irish or is it Anglo-Saxon or shall we compromise and say it was made in Iona just to keep everybody happy, but anyway it's got these beasts which as you can see are sort of twisted and snaky and are quite reminiscent of these sorts of beasts and these ones and all the ones on the cross. So. A wonderful mixture of iconographies and reinterpretations of things. Okay, so pursuing this theme of, of Christianity, um, the tomb at Prittlewell, the burial at, at Prittlewell, which is near South End in Essex, and this was found in 2003-04, I think, and typically in one of those cold winters. This was one of those things, it was a sort of mound on a roundabout, which hadn't been destroyed for some reason. And the road widening, um, archaeology ahead of the road widening, and in fact, the road widening never happened, I think, in the end, um, discovered this, um, you know, un, almost, well, undisturbed. It hadn't been robbed. It hadn't been, since it had been put there in 600, possibly a bit before 600 AD, um, there it was with all the things hanging on the wall. This is a, a drawing, a reconstruction, but it honestly does look rather like that. And you can see here are these little glass vessels and they're sort of sitting on the side. There are, I don't think I put in many of the slight pictures because after all, this is a, just a quick, a quick in, intro to the, to the site of Prittlewell. It's got this little gold buckle, which is very flimsy and has no signs of wear and would fall to pieces if you did try to wear it. So that is one of the things that dates that. It's that type of brooch, I mean, type of buckle, which belongs to the, which doesn't go very far into the seventh century at all. Um, this is an imported thing. Let me have a look. It's got, okay, so it's got imported things. It's got local things. It's got two more of these Merovingian coins, which are very annoying. It's not being very precisely datable, but look what it's got there. It's got these two little tiny flimsy gold foil crosses, which were probably laid on the eyes of the body. Uh, it's another of these bodies that isn't there. They had um, the cap of a tooth, I think. There's a, there's a bit of one tooth, a bit of enamel from one tooth survived. So these crosses are, are laid on the eyes of the person buried in that grave. So either that person was a Christian or whoever was burying them was. And yet they're buried with all this panoply like the Southern Who stuff and I think you know this is this isn't the only instance of elaborate burials with lots of stuff there are, there are plenty on the continent where actually there's sometimes even in a church um, some of the early founding Christian burials we, we shouldn't sort of have this hard and fast line that putting things in a grave means you're a pagan and not having them in means you're a Christian. It doesn't work like that at all. And certainly at this stage, 
in the seventh century, in the early days of conversion, and when things were being sort of sorted out and reinterpreted and reimagined, I, I think it's not at all surprising that we find these sorts of things. The dating of this at the moment depends on some radiocarbon dates, it depends on um, typology. It's being argued that it, by, by the main, by the lead author, Chris Skull, it's argued that this is probably in the 680s or 90s, and that therefore it predates St. Augustine's visit to Kent to convert the Anglo-Saxons in 697, which doesn't worry me in the least. I mean, in fact, there were clearly Christians in Kent before Augustine arrived. That's why he came, because uh, Ethelbert had married Bertha, who was a Frankish Christian princess. There would be bound to have been Christians. Um, the, one, one, the, the Essex king of the day um, was married to the sister of Ethelbert, who was quite possibly could have been a Christian herself. So I don't see why there would not have been Christians in England before St. Augustine. It's another of these things like, you know, since you've got Redwald, it has to be Redwald, which I suppose perhaps it might be. Um, if you've got Christianity, it has to be after 697. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily at all. And it demonstrates that it doesn't. It's beautiful glass things, these glass things. There are they're, they're, um, not very many of these uh, crisscross trellis work on them. And then Rendlesham, which I must finish up with. Um, Rendlesham is pretty close to Sutton Hoo. It's a little bit further up the River Deben. So there's Sutton Hoo, and here is Rendlesham. And here again, Bede gives us chapter and verse that uh, Rendlesham is where um, Redwald actually had a Villa Regia. He actually lived there, and maybe he did live there at one stage or another. And in recent years, so a lot of people have looked for Rendlesham, but eventually it was the metal detectorists who found it. And originally some fly-by-night type metal detectorists came illegally and took away stuff, but then it was very systematically searched by these, this excellent team here who um, walked up and down these fields over and over again um, in collaboration with the Suffolk Archaeological Service and produced masses and masses of stuff. There's been limited excavation and um, probably will be some more there are some excellent online lectures about the site and it's it's producing all sorts of extraordinary things there, there, there is metal working going on there are byzantine coins there are things coming in there are local things being made and it occupies this huge huge area i haven't got to that bit yet so what rendlesham tells us is that you know sutton who could it could have been where the sutton who people lived or alternatively, it could have been an alternative residence. It definitely shows that material like the material buried in Southern Who Mound One was being made at very close by in, in Rendlesham. And that this was a site that was continued in occupation and significance through from the late Roman into perhaps the, um, well, the late seventh century, eighth century probably. So it's a, it's a local, a locally significant place which is in operation in the late Roman period and through into the early medieval and is probably eventually eclipsed when Ipswich starts up um, in the 700s, which I'm not going to talk about today. Right, so all these new and interesting finds coming up in quite recent years, which all combine to give us a, an image of a fairly dynamic period in, in the seventh century particularly, and East Anglia is a place that was in contact with the rest of the world that was, had craftsmen that could produce amazingly complicated and interesting stuff, and that was able to muster large numbers of people to do all sorts of stuff, and was, had an independent take on things like Christianity coming in from outside. Um, I didn't say that, that, that one of Martin Carver's um, contentions is that he's, that Sutton Hoo is aggressively pagan and that this is a symbol of the East Anglians standing out against the Frankish Christians that uh, both Kent and Northumbria were going in for. I don't follow that line. I, I think I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't stick by it being such a clear cut distinction between pagan and Christian myself. I, I think Redwall certainly did probably dabble with um, Christianity. Okay, so let's return to the film The Dig, and you can see that they focused only on one part of the story, 
And I said at the beginning, I, I think they, they had the atmospheric uh, Suffolk landscape beautifully down, even although their actual reconstruction of the boat was in Surrey, I think. But I, I think the central characters were brilliant, Edith and Basil. And Edith didn't die at the um, end of the dig. She she had a few years, she died in 1942. She she had, well, it says in a, a little biography of her that she, she had a blood clot or something, but she was pretty active up to the end. She was sitting as a magistrate in Woodbridge the day she died, I think. But she, she was in ill health, but, but not quite so faded away. Her son, Robert, um, was then went to live with her sister, Elizabeth, his aunt, and was brought up by her. Basil lived on to, I don't know, wait in his late 80s, nearly 90, and went on digging. I, I met him once. He, he came to West Stowe and um, because he worked with Stanley West, who was running the dig at West Stowe, he was he was very much into spiritualism, which which Stanley, I think, thought was a bit odd. He dug himself. He and Stanley had dug a small trench looking for some Roman kilns at uh, West Stowe. So, in fact, the, the, the sort of the imminent World War Two problem, um, they were all, it was very imminent, it was about to happen, but most of these people survived actually. Um, I don't think any of them was killed in, in the war, though they had various war work, and various service in different places. So down here on the bottom, these three, um, <laughs> three musketeers, I think he looks like the baddie in The Rage of the Lost Ark, but that's a bit unfair. Um, <laughs> it is actually Kendrick, who eventually became Sir Thomas Kendrick, director of the British Museum, and that's somebody else from the BM called Plendelis, who was into the conservation. But this is Guy Maynard, and I, I feel a bit sorry for Guy Maynard from Ipswich Museum, because he obviously would have loved to have had all the treasure in, in Ipswich Museum. And he didn't have it, and he had several he had several run-ins with Charles Phillips, who is there. The, I mean, the two of them really never <laughs> never got on and didn't couldn't speak to each other, I don't think. Um, these characters here, well, there's a yeah, Basil, Basil, yes, I'll come on to Basil Brown in a minute. Um, here is um, Peggy Piggott, as she then was. And Peggy um, was married to Stuart for about 20 years. The novel on which this is based, which was actually written by um, her nephew, John Preston, speculated that, um, that Stuart was gay. I have no idea. Who knows? Anyway, they were married for 20 years. The marriage broke down in the 50s, though, not in 1939. And Peggy then married um, an Italian. I don't think that marriage lasted very long either. And when I met her in the 1970s, she, she was there after, usually known as Peggy Guida. She was traveling around with a friend in a, in a camper van looking at Anglo-Saxon beads because she wrote an excellent book on Anglo-Saxon beads. She was very jolly. And she and Stuart were jointly president of the Wiltshire Archaeological Society. In, you know, for, in, their, in their older age, they lived close to each other and knew each other. I don't think they moved back in together, but you know, they were, they were friends in their older age. Stuart, of course, became, he had been working on Windmill Hill and Avebury. He became professor in Edinburgh. Um, this one with his back to us. So that's Stuart, that's Peggy, that's Charles Phillips, um, that's um, Grimes, who um, got quite famous for excavating the Mithraeum in London when London had been bombed. He became director of the Institute of Archaeology in London. I remember hearing him lecture. And that's the bottom half of Graham Clark, <laughs> who um, didn't actually excavate but came out from Cambridge to visit and was, of course, for many years professor of archaeology. At, um, at Cambridge. So before I get onto this, just to say something about Basil Brown, and incidentally, that photograph there is taken by Basil. So Basil and his relationship to all these other archaeologists who, who came in, there obviously was some tension. I, and, you know, he, it, it was a partly a class issue. He was, to some extent, a, a labourer. He was, you know, he, he was paid by Mrs. Pritchie. And that, of course, was what he and she insisted on rightly and said he couldn't be sacked by um, Phillips or by some Ipswich Museum. He, I think he and Charles Phillips did get actually a decent relationship going and stayed in touch for the rest of their lives, in fact. Um, and later on, um, Rupert Bruce Midford um, had a lot of contact with, with Basil. Um, he came 
to visit the, the treasure in the, in the museum on more than one occasion and um, was, in, was in touch with Rupert. He died in 77, so he didn't get to see Martin's excavations, whereas Charles Phillips lived into the 80s, so he did, did come and visit, and so did Rupert, in fact. So um, there was a decent relationship, I think, between, between those people actually working on, on, on the site. But it's true that Basil was a bit eclipsed in terms of news about it. So, I mean, when I first heard about Southern Who, it was all about the treasure and about the stuff in the British Museum and Rupert Bruce Mitford and um, the, this other um, set of people here. And OK, yes, Basil had dug the boat. Wasn't that a good thing? But not much about him. And the, there's an account uh, by someone who, who knew Basil who, who said she went to look at a big exhibition they had and it never mentioned Basil. And I think that's true. I think the British Museum exhibition of Sutton Hoo until very recently didn't say very much about Basil and that was really I think because it was so much about the treasure it was it was all about you know the treasure the beautiful things that we've got on display in the museum and it wasn't so much about the ship um, and about the technical cleverness that we can understand how all these things were made and where they all came from and so I think he did get sidelined a bit but as I said, he, he certainly wasn't forgotten by all the other excavators at the site. Um, and he, uh, I think it is good that he's got his due now in, in this film, right? that, 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 um, that gives one the, the impression of, of, of how significant it was, because if he hadn't excavated that boat so successfully as he did, um, the thing wouldn't have been so, um, been, become so, so famous, and indeed, indeed it wouldn't have been such a good excavation. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's good that he has now got his due and has been acted so beautifully by Ray Fines. So I think at that point I'll stop, and I should of course give thanks to all the people who um, whose works I have read, and you can find out more about. I went through everything quite quickly, I know, and you can find out more about everything. There is a, a great wealth of printed and online resources of one kind or another. And I suppose I say thanks to Martin because I had used quite a lot of his pictures actually, and also had some arguments with him about stuff. And so I do admire him as, as a field archeologist. I think his unraveling of, of, of Mount Two is pretty astonishing really. Right. Well, I'm gonna unmute myself and thank you very much. And, uh... This is the way we do it now in the land, in land of Zoom. Um, thank you yeah. so much, Catherine. That was just fantastic and so rich of material. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. So uh, there are a, a few um, attendees today. And so I'd like to open up uh, if there's any questions. Uh, we, we probably don't want to take too much time, but maybe just a couple questions, Catherine, if you'd be willing to yeah, certainly, certainly. I hope I haven't gone on too long. I'm afraid yeah. I didn't keep you too track of the time. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And you covered so much. I'm sure you answered a lot of questions that, you know, people who've seen the movie and don't know much about um, just many things about it, not only what, how the movie was made in a way, what they uh, um, accentuated, but also the site in its whole kind of place in its time and world really rich wonderful so i'm gonna uh leave the uh open i uh, would you unmute yourselves if you have a question please and um uh either say you have a question in chat and then i'll call on you or just shout out your question uh this is tim i have a question yeah great the faceless one here sorry i'll, I'll figure out the camera later don't yeah, worry. <laughs> just on this, I, I'm I'm just curious to hear maybe a few more comments on the interplay between a partly fictional and partly truthful representation in the movie, on the one hand, and you know what actually happened. And uh, you know, obviously, it was a I don't know if it was made in Hollywood, but it was kind of a Hollywood inspired by a true story kind of thing. And in those situations, they tend to change characters around. And I get it; it was based on a novel that itself wasn't entirely accurate historically. Uh, but, but I'm curious in terms of the effect. I mean, a lot of us have, have seen it and other people I've talked to have seen it and really liked the movie. So I'm just curious what you think the effect of a movie like that will have, positive and negative, on 
on this okay. excavation and, and uh, English archaeology? Well, I suppose I was trying to answer some aspects of that question. I mean, I I enjoyed the film. I, I liked it and I thought some of it was very good. Quite a lot of it was quite carefully researched. I mean, that kind of film always goes into, you know, what kind of car or what kind of telephone or what kind of machine would she have had her heart tested on? Or, you know, I mean, the, all that kind of surrounding detail. And I think they went to quite a lot of trouble doing their their reconstructed dig. You know, they, they dug this hole in some field, I think in Surrey somewhere. So it wasn't digging through sand. So I think the, the, the main thing that wasn't true was um, the fictional relationship between Peggy, Peggy, Peggy Guido and the invented photographer. And I think, I think that did jar a bit. Um, I can see it was better in the film than it was in the book. I, I liked the film better than I liked the book. In the book, I did have this, I felt a bit queasy because these were people I knew actually, although I didn't know them well, they were all pretty ancient when I was a student and I went to their lectures and things like that. But I, I don't know, I, I didn't like that. But in the film, even the love affair was slightly better because it was feeding into that theme about the imminence of World War II and the transience of life and all that kind of stuff. So I think there were, I think there were things that, that, that particularly Basil Brown said and did. There were things that I didn't mind. I didn't mind the fictional bit of Robert on his bicycle, bicycling to tell Basil to come back, which, I mean, you know, that didn't happen, but um, I, didn't, I didn't mind that. I mean, I think he probably did have to sort of, you know, take a deep breath and think, right, I'm going on. And his diary has things about how he tries to keep out of the disputes and arguments and so forth. So, so I thought it was a lot better than a lot of films I've seen that purport to be about real things, which usually annoy me a lot. And this one, after all, I know quite a lot about. The effect on British archaeology, um, well, every so often we have something that enlivens us and brings us into the um, public domain. And I think this isn't a bad thing. Um, I suppose it focused a bit on the on the class issue. That was another strand that came in, you know, the bit between Basil and all the characters coming down from London. And indeed, Edith Pretty. I mean, you know, she <laughs> Edith Pretty lived all by herself as a poor widow with with one child, but she had about I don't know about eight staff in that house. I think you know there were there were she had two gardeners, she had a cook, she had um, maids and a butler. You know, like the butler who was being so you know unfriendly when Basil first knocked on the door, <laughs> things like that. Um, I think it's on the whole positive. I mean, we did, we only saw a bit of the digging. Um, it wasn't the, the most, I mean, these days, if you did a dig like that, if you didn't have a world war looming down you or COVID or something, well, <laughs> um, you would lift a lot of those things in blocks, I suppose. And of course, when, yeah, so when the later excavations happened, there was, they were slower and they were very, they were more meticulous. And uh, except, you know, having said that, Basil was pretty meticulous on that boat. So, yeah, I mean, I do, I do find those, those real, those things based on a real story, I do find a bit queasy making. And I was actually surprised that I enjoyed this one a lot more than I expected to. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. It's a, it's a, quite a tricky, interesting question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question actually about visiting these different places. Um, so the British Museum and the actual site of Sutton Hoo. I yeah. haven't been there and I know, you know, post COVID, hopefully people will have been intrigued by this film and will want to know more. Mm -hmm. And so can you comment on what um, what there is to actually see at Sutton Hoo and how that okay. experience is different than what well, you see at the museum? Sutton Hoo, um, Sutton Hoo now belongs to the National Trust. And um, I know they've been revamping their visitor center. So the house that belonged to Mrs. Pretty, the last time I was there a year or two ago, before COVID, um, they had a very good exhibition about the 1939 
excavation in what had been Mrs. Pretty's drawing room. And they had various films and news, news reports. There were, there were a couple of television films made um, in the 60s and 70s, which had people reminiscing and talking about it. So that was excellent. And I do hope that exhibition is still there. It was about the best thing I think they've done. The visitor center, they were just revamping. That, that doesn't have most of the original finds in it which in some ways I should have thought is quite a good thing because it means it doesn't have to have such dreadful security and insurance and so forth. Um, it's had a couple of incarnations of, of different versions of the cent of, re of reconstructions of the central burial chamber in it, neither of which worked. And I don't know what the present one's like, I, I don't know, and, and the videos of things. And, and lots of, they had some actual finds from the 1980s excavation and from the Tranmer House, actually. It had, had some stuff from the Tranmer House. So they usually have some actual finds and also some replicas. And the replicas are usually are interesting because there are a lot of enthusiasts down there who do things like there was a, a, a retired mason who made a beautiful replica of the whetstone and you know all the time he was doing it brian ansell his name and he was sitting there doing it and he said he you know he learned so much about the original while he was doing it all the careful measurements and, and all that sort of stuff and um and so people could watch him doing it and that's always very interesting <laughs> and um and so it's a very authentic, you know, it's a very beautifully shaped and, and accurate replica, replica of the swords. And there were usually reenactors around there dressed up as Redwald. Um, well, on a, on a high day and holiday, not, not every day, obviously. So there's the, the visitor center that you actually go into and you can see displays and information and replicas and stuff and so forth. The house, as I said, the last time I was there, it was open. And then you walk out to the mounds and they were redoing how you approached them. They, they, I think they've changed, uh, they've constructed a rather wonky looking tower that you were supposed to be able to go up. I wasn't sure how that was going to work. I may be proved wrong. When I saw them building it, I thought that looks a bit wobbly and you can only get six people in it. It's going to take forever and ever for anybody to get up there actually. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. But you, you know, yes. So you walk up, you go. It's a nice, it's, it's a very nice visit. I do, in fact, recommend it. You can, and it combines, you know, it's got the usual National Trust, nice tea shop and, um, and shop and lavatories and so forth, all very convenient. The whatever's going on in the actual house, which I hope is still that Mrs. Pretty 1939 exhibition. The visitor centre, which, you know, you go, it's, it's, it's a big room kind of thing and you go in and you see a lot of stuff and then walking around the mounds. And, and no, definitely. I, the British Museum experience is different and it's, you know, it's, you've probably been to the British Museum, you know, it's one gallery. And again, the last time they redid that, I thought they'd focused even more than usual on treasure, on glitter. So the great gold buckle, you could hardly see it was just going bling, bling, bling at you, which was possibly deliberate the way they'd lit it. You couldn't see the detail. You couldn't see the animal ornament on it at all. And not much of the kind of thing I've been talking about is in that display, as I recall it. I mean, it's, it's you know, beautifully displayed artifacts and um, talking about them, but not so much about the background of the site, I don't think. So you should do both, of course. But if I was going to choose, I think I'd go to the um, I'd go to the actual site. I go to some who and stuff. But they're not open at the moment. If you, I think you can go and walk around. I think I think at the moment Sutton who, if you're a local, it can be the place that you go for a walk. But I don't think you're supposed to drive there from anywhere else at the moment. And uh, certainly the the visitor centre wouldn't be open. But hopefully, hopefully, cross fingers soon. <laughs> I have a question. Um, <clears throat> you probably know, Catherine, and thank you so much. That was really an amazing talk and really oh, good. <laughs> um, so much uh, <clears throat> more to think about. And I think for people who've only seen the movie, I mean, it's a wonderful uh, <clears throat> way to convey to them <clears throat> the uh, difficulties, oh, the anxieties, the contacts, and all the kinds of things you have to think about that makes archaeology so much more than the treasure, um, which is, of course, what we all all want. But if you are properly aware, there has been a, a, a blog post that's gone around about some of the issues regarding the um, representation of the women in the movie. Um, and um, I guess the one question in terms of where you might uh, move a little bit away from interpretation 
I mean, was Mrs. Pretty represented as some sort of weakling? Um, and that's, that's an interpretation. But what about the fact, the photographer is what um, people have focused on. Yes, that's right. So, I mean, Mrs. Pretty, as I said, that, that, you know, in uh, the first, well, the first 40 years of her life had been a pretty, I mean, perhaps a devoted daughter, but also a very energetic and well-traveled woman and a philanthropist and a magistrate and God knows what all. She was, you know, she was not in good health by the time the excavation happened. Um, she was obviously older than, than Carrie Mulligan presents her as being, um, but she, she was a woman with her own ideas, her own mind. So, I, I mean, I, I didn't mind too much the way she was represented and it, it exaggerated her illness and, you know, made her a bit, but the other women, yes. I mean, I think I did say that, that Peggy Piggott was misrepresented. I mean, that's perfectly true. She was shown as being a bit of a, well, she's very beautiful, of course, Lily James, <laughs> but she comes in and, you know, treads on things. Whereas in fact, she'd been digging for a couple of years. And I think, I think Rachel Pope, who's one of the most energetic um, critics of this is writing a book about her, I hope she does, an interesting woman. So she'd, she'd been, um, she was an experienced archeologist. She knew what she was doing. And also she certainly hadn't come fresh on her honeymoon and um, she remained married to Stuart for years and years afterwards. And I think the thing I disliked most about the book, which also turns up a little bit in the film, was this bit about, you know, Stuart being gay and they, you know, the non-consummation of the marriage. Though I have to say, somebody did say that the end of their marriage, it was on grounds of non-consummation, but I just thought that was very prurient somehow and I didn't like it at all. And it, didn't represent Peggy as being, you know, a dynamic, energetic woman, which, you know, she was young in those days, but she was certainly a pretty forceful, a jolly sort of female at the time I knew a little bit about her and, and met her. So yes, it does misrepresent her. And I think that was following the novel story. And I really, I, I dislike that, as I said, I thought, I thought the invented photographer worked better in the film than in the novel where I disliked him quite a lot. And yeah, those, those women, they, those Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff, they were pioneering in, in terms of the photography they achieved. It is true they didn't take the site photos. They, they took the empty ship, um, many pictures of the empty ship. Very, I mean, that's our best evidence for, the, for that ship is, is their photographs. Um, the side photographs were mostly taken by members of the, of the team, you know, Phillips or Crawford. Crawford took a lot of them, OGS Crawford, who um, founded Antiquity and um, did all sorts of other things. So, I, I mean, I, I read some of that stuff and I, and, and I agree, it, it, it was, un, it's certainly unfair to Peggy and um, it, it sort of, you know, reminded me of how much I disliked that particular bit. I didn't like the book at all, to be perfectly honest. I, I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking forward to the film and then I was rather seduced by it. I, you know, it was, I, I thought it was, I thought it did a lot of good things, the film, whereas uh, I wasn't so sure about that book. Right. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, um, denying or erasing the existence of the two women as the photographers was, you know, really... Um, yeah. And, Although uh, they did come in late, but they, they, they were in the later phase. But yes, it was. Yes, it was a bad thing. I think you're right about um, the representation of Peggy Piggott is the ultimate. Why he did that, I don't know. And in the book, no, it's not weird. He, she was in the aunt, book, he, he does the same thing. And mm. he's writing about her as some kind of ingenue. Yes, um, and that's what and Lily that James acted and, her and at. Too. She didn't, yeah. They were married long before Sutton Who. So they were married in 1956. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's three years before, whereas now it looks as though she, they were having their honeymoon in the book. And she was least. just discovering. I know, I know it's ridiculous. It's, it really it's was, crazy. It? And she was actually uh, uh, just as experienced in the field as, as Stuart was. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I was really interested. I didn't realize until the, I saw the credits that the Stuart they were talking about was my old professor, Stuart Piggott. <laughs> right, oh yes, and that's right. I, yes. And then I kind of, it's, I mean, I know that you, you were kind of offended by the way he was portrayed, but he was a little like that. There was mm -hmm. definitely, you know, the distancing from any, um, from intimacy was right. definitely part of yeah. his 
his character. But um, so I, I actually thought that that was caught, although it was very exaggerated in the film. You know, it was became part of part of the theme. But but the way she was treated was, I thought, not yeah. not good. And it started with his, her nephew. He yes. was the one who, yes. who did the portraying. You'd think that he would have had more respect for his aunt. In yes, it's very, it's very odd. I mean, he's he's an, an author who's written, uh, you know, highly acclaimed biographies, including yeah. a recent one of Maxwell. So he, you know, he's a an experienced man, knows what he's doing. I, don't, I but not in that novel. I, I really don't know why he did that at all. <laughs> I wouldn't want my nephew to write about me in that way. It's just the way um, you know, in like that. that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. And I mean, in the film, the chap was going off, obviously, to be killed in the Battle of Britain. One could see that. So, so it's they sort of got it into a theme, a meaningful theme. But I, I agree, it was it was not not needed at all. And it also meant we had one brief horrible glimpse of some so, some humping going on in, out among the trees, which the film was otherwise mercifully free of. I think that was. When, when I, I actually saw a preview and they had a question and answer session with the um, actors and they they were talking to each other, not to us, I mean, you know, but it was interesting to see what they had to say. And they, they, they were nice and they'd sort of taken it seriously. I know Ralph, um, uh, what not, certainly had taken it very seriously and found out about archaeology and has a, has a stepbrother who is an archaeologist, I think, something like that. But um, anyway, they, they had actually, you know, they had this discussion about it was good that there wasn't a lot of sex in it, and that they'd resisted the temptation to make the ghastly idea that Basil and Edith might have had an affair, you know, which was, which, you know, which even a trendy film director didn't manage to <laughs> stoop to that level. So yeah, no, it was lovely to have a film that didn't have any sex in it, at least hardly any, um, except shoehorned in with, with, the, with the fake photographer. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think that we have uh, asked many questions of you, and you've answered many questions in your talk. So uh, I really think that we'll um, call it a day now. And really, thank you again for Catherine for this knowledgeable and deep deep read deeply read uh talk about it's just my subject <laughs> i know that is about Bolivia, Christine. you're the one to do it exactly um we're uh, i'm thrilled that you agreed to do this and very appreciative um and i know that many many people will be um enjoying this lecture of yours so i'd really like to thank you very much and i don't know how really to do it with any kind of um happy <laughs> applause other than everybody should no, 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 no. themselves because if they don't it's only me applauding so maybe you could all do that so we could all thank you <laughs> thank you thank you very much you're a, you're a lovely audience and considering it's breakfast time i think that's pretty impressive and uh, no, no thank you very much for inviting me christine because it it did as i say it it prodded me to go back and and, and revisit all this stuff and which also i i've been thinking of since since i've watched the film and i started having thoughts but uh, yeah I mean it's 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 interesting so I, I don't know what effect it'll have on archaeology you know it's one of those things that brings it to the fore and makes people think about it for a while and then it fades away again I suppose but, but anyway well, yeah. not really not in England Sutton who's going to remain always very popular so well I'm sure the National Trust is looking forward to opening and hoping that the the, the film bounce will <laughs> will carry over into May or June or whenever it is right. we're allowed to emerge into the world again. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure. I hope all of you, uh, you look well. I hope you all are um, ticking over in we're this. Hanging in there with our vaccine. Hanging on in there in this weird <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. I'm going to um, stop recording, I guess. And look, all of this, all of these in, things that I sent you about further 